was living in Hawaii when Mimi and I met. Mimi was living in Atlanta. And we had this long distance relationship going and you know how wonderful those last. And so that, we, we decided to meet halfway. Actually, we had a deal. <laughs> we had a deal that one year after we moved to California and we got ourselves all settled and married or whatever we were gonna do, we would go back to Hawaii. I'm still waiting for that. Working at CNN in the very early days, and then I worked in their documentary unit and on a production, met Mike. Um, she hired me. <laughs> She's still paying that invoice. <laughs> Long contract that one was. Eventually I left um, TBS and joined Mike and then we made a number of films together just all around the world in different places and so through that experience I got to see the ocean in a completely different way than I ever had um, and just fell in love with it. Fell in love with Mike, fell in love with the ocean and it's just been a huge part of our lives. I think when people are really listening to their intuition, they're finding something that they truly love and are passionate about and are communicating that, the world's a better place. I mean, it, things start to hum. When I was a grad student, I was three years, I just had a little bit to go in a PhD and I was thinking that's what I would do and I would be, you know, probably teaching ZO 101 the rest of my life, fighting my friends for tenure at some university. And what happened is I was working at the Waikiki Aquarium as I was a grad student at the University of Hawaii and a guy walked into the aquarium one day and he saw the chambered nautilus on display, which a friend of mine and I had collected. And it happened to be the animal that I was my study animal for as a grad student. Anyway, this guy wanted me to collect some for him because he had a company called Nautilus. He built the exercise equipment and he wanted me to collect them and send the nautilus back to Florida so he could have them on display. And I'm going, Arthur, look, these animals are cephalopods. They can't handle any heavy metals, you know. So the refrigeration system that is required. Go to a shell shop and save yourself, you know, a lot of money. Nope, he wouldn't hear of it. So he sent myself and some friends out to the South Pacific to collect a uh, chambered Nautilus for him. And at the last minute, he gave us a couple of movie cameras and said, make a film about this. <laughs> How do you, we're literally reading the manual of how to load these 16 millimeter magazines on the airplane going to Palau. And we did, we made a film which was a horrible, horrible film. No, it was film. not, it was a good film. <laughs> See, my wife. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. <laughs> anyway, it was the most fun I had ever had. And I thought, well, wait a second. This was so much fun. And I can make movies about the animals that I've been learning about. Maybe I should just be a filmmaker and teach to the millions rather than the hundreds. And so I literally came back from that trip, quit school, hung my filmmaking shingle, never told anyone I didn't know what I was doing and just started making films. But the point of it all is that it was fun. It is fun. And I just kept doing it and kept doing it and got better and better and better and then got paid for it and it's the only job I've ever had. I mean, those expeditions were so much fun. Um, it was hard in a way, on the one hand, to give up that in exchange for raising kids. On the other hand, it's just the most rewarding. I mean, I love filmmaking, but um, about three years after our younger child was born, two, two or three years, I went into the office and I, remember this <laughs> and day. I, I started packing. Mike was like, what are you doing? I said, you I thought know, you were cleaning your desk. I know. Oh, you were cleaning up, that's nice. And I said, you know, I'm firing myself. <laughs> I just can't remember Frances when she was a baby. I mean, and it's just too important. It's too important for me, to me, personally. Forget about it. I mean, hopefully she wanted me home more. This is a really vibrant community. People are really involved in their children's schools, in the nonprofits in the area. They're, um, I mean, in every realm, they're just, um, they're really dedicated to building a stronger and better community. So being a part of that and then helping in whatever way I might um, enhance that has been really important to me. And Mike has traveled so much and is still traveling so much that it's um, even more important, I think, for me to be more involved with the kids. After a while, when 
you know, this environmental uh, disaster that we're facing now, I think many environmental disasters we're facing, started hitting us in the face and becoming apparent. You know, too many people demanding too many resources and ocean acidification and the, the climate is warming and coral reefs are dying and plastics are everywhere. And every time you turn around, there's something else we're doing that isn't so helpful to the environment. I started looking more at that and started feeling a responsibility to show the warts. And yeah, sure, we can shoot great animal behavior and we can show pristine areas, but at the same time, let people appreciate that they're shrinking and they're going away and it's up to us right now to do something about that. It's a wonderful thing to be alive as a human, but we've really we've really gone off course. I mean, we're, we, we are so, we consider ourselves so separate from the rest of the environment. And in doing that, have just decimated everything that comes in our path. I think, to me, what, one of my passions now is to help look at us as yet another animal, remind people that, look, we are just another animal. Start looking at yourselves as part of the ecosystem. Don't, don't insulate yourself so much from everything. Because in doing that, you're not so sensitive to the ecosystem around you. And in, without that sensitivity, I think we trash it. I just came back from France, diving in a submarine in the bottom of the Mediterranean. And a submarine just plops down in the middle of nowhere and there's huge bundles of trash. What is wrong with this picture? What are we doing? So that's kind of what I'm thinking these days is more environmental stuff. And, and when I talk with schools and, and kids and, well, gee, how do you become a marine, you know, a, a, an underwater filmmaker? I want to do that. Just do it. Just start making movies. They'll be horrible at first. It doesn't matter. You know, you'll still have fun doing it. And the more you do it, the better you'll get. And at, at a certain point, you realize, well, somebody will pay attention to it and they'll pay you to do it. And the next thing you know, you're a professional. I think one of the real challenges now for kids and adults is there is so much pressure and so much competition that it's very hard to filter out that noise and just take a moment and listen to your intuition. We give very little credence or attention to developing intuition and instinct in kids listening to it because we're so we're pushing them so much to hurry hurry do this do that really what i think allows people to get ahead is taking that moment to stop and listen to whatever that intu intuitive voice within you is saying mm -hmm. and that's those people that have that gift and that ability to do tune into that are the ones i think that fly i mean they just soar and so i hope our kids you know, we haven't talked about it that much, but I hope we've, we've certainly let them wander enough and we haven't pushed them probably as much as maybe we should have. But my whole intent, without even really realizing it, was to allow them the moment to breathe and think, figure out who they are and listen to that intuition. And I think you, you follow your intuition in your gut all the time with work. I mean, it's well, harder. Well, I, have to, I have to interrupt you one second. You see why I'm married or now? <laughs> <laughs>